りおしまい。Welcome back, Dragon Ballers, to Get the Mic, the only show where your host on the left, Owl, and your host on the right, Brock, dissect fiction for its mythological significance. On this episode, we're talking about Dragon Ball, as usual, specifically the episode The True Colors of the Masked Man, or the, is it the true identity? Just the identity. The identity of the Masked Man, either of those. I kind of like the true colors. It is a longer title, but I think it's more in line with the spirit. Someone's true colors mm. is much more aligned with their spirit, I would say. So. Than just their identity. Sure. That can be dissociated, definitely. True right. colors, I would say, no. Couldn't, couldn't, that's like your core. Oh, you throw in truth. Truth, yeah. Well, so we're going to get to that in just a second. But before we get started, please give us a like, subscribe, leave a comment if you agree, if you disagree. We'd love to hear what you have to say. We upload on YouTube Mondays and Thursdays, and we also upload on Rumble Tuesdays and Fridays. So give us a subscribe, give us a rumble, and I think without further ado, episode 76, The True Colors of the Masked Man. So, the first thing we're going to see here, and this is kind of, some of this is a little out of order, but uh, that's okay. It's for the purposes of let's say, blending some of these things. Uh, some of the cuts are not the best. But the first thing we see is Pilaf trains with a newly designed exoskeleton while his crew, Shu and Mai, watch a display showing Goku's fight with Grandpa Gohan. When they see that Goku is immobilized by Gohan grabbing his tail, they rush to tell Pilaf. Pilaf is ecstatic, and we see that there are actually three exoskeletons for the gang. Pilaf then reveals that he has the final Dragon Ball stored inside of a box that can't be penetrated by the Dragon Radar. He says that with their spy satellite, Goku's Dragon Balls are ripe for the taking. When Mai reminds them that Baba will be able to find the Dragon Ball regardless, he says that she probably couldn't find it anyway, and that even if she did, they would easily beat Goku with their new power suits. So they speed off in a pink car to confront Goku. So this first section that we jump into, uh, originally in the episode, we have a quick cut just showing Goku gets smacked on the ground over and over again. Um, but really, this is kind of laying the groundwork of the, of of what the, uh, you could say like the uh, the stakes are of this interaction, right? Because we're coming full circle on everything in this episode. So starting off with the scene with Pilaf when he's been gone for so long and what he's represented before, which is sort of that immature masculine spirit. Immature adversarial or, spirit is what you meant Why to I say, say masculine. Immature yeah. adversarial spirit. 
Um, the foolish adversary. Coming full circle, right? So we establish it here early in the episode because this is something that has to be squared so that we can do what we did before, which we know the goal here is ultimately to get back to that eternal dragon. Well, what happened in the beginning of this arc? Goku was kind of bested by Pilaf's flying fortress, right? And then Pilaf's flying fortress was then bested by the Red Ribbon Army. And Goku has now defeated the Red Ribbon Army. Yes. Right? He, he's plunged himself into the underworld, right? He's met his father, and now he's ready to go, right? Now, now we're setting up the next step, which is that return, that re, uh, resurfacing. And we've seen what Pilaf's been doing in the meantime, preparing, right? Um, right, we see that he has a technological advancement that he's made. And so that technology is really important, right? Because his technology was something that did best Goku before. Mm-hmm. And so we see here again that he's advanced his technology. The first thing we see is, is th- his treatment of the boulder, right? So he splits a boulder and he picks one up and he smashes one. And that's really, it's interesting. You can think back to whenever Goku was training with Master Roshi and sort of his, the, the gate between him and the world tournament was the boulder, right? If you can move the biggest boulder that I can throw at you, right? And so we see kind of a splitting of that idea here with Pilaf where it, he, he splits the boulder in half and then he crushes the boulder. And, and so I think that, that the, in the moving of the boulder is something that you see in more symbolic stories like this, where um, it's it's almost like a passing of a threshold, right? You can you can even think of it somewhat like, well, what happens with the Christ story at the end of the day when you've got the rebirth is that the boulder gets rolled away, right? Mm-hmm. And so we see that the first thing we see about Pilaf when he's reintroduced is that he's able to split the boulder and crush it. And so, yeah, that's what his technology does. And so he's... Well, that's one thing. The other thing is the box that right. hides the Dragon Ball from the Dragon Radar. Notice again, he has the one star ball. This is different from the jammer, right? So Red had a jammer that made it so that nobody could see where the Dragon Ball is. But Pilaf has designed a technology that makes it so that only he can see where this Dragon Ball is. And why is that? It's because the instantiation of Red Spirit, right? Which is that... Um... The what what did I say? Envious. Envious. That's yeah. what I was looking for. The envious the envious spirit is not going to be able to conceal itself as well as the foolish adversary. The foolish adversary is all about misdirection and concealment and tricks, more or less, right? And this is just an explanation of that, right? Uh he has a box that he's designed that no one else can find, right? He's and this is something he did in the castle in the desert as well. He's hidden something away that's uh, beyond, let's say, the sight of normal being. It makes me think of so. There's two things, right? The foolish adversarial and and the, and the um the the foolish nature of the appearance of Pilaf and how he's he's got the frills on him and he's almost uh, jesterish in the way that he looks. It almost makes me think of the um the spy type characters like in a song of ice and fire right where they will take information and they'll keep it for themselves and they'll conceal it from everybody else and use it for their own advantage and it's a misdirect right so you see like little finger saying well chaos is a ladder right and, and little finger is another one of those characters who's okay with being called little finger that's why he's called little finger right is that he's okay with people interpreting him to be more foolish than he really is it's like varies right he's more mm-hmm. he's okay with being interpreted as uh impotent and what those characters do is they take the unknown and they box it up and they keep it for themselves and they keep it for their own advantage. Well, they know it, right? They exactly. take the known and they box it up to the unknown for the rest of the world. Exactly. They keep it unknown, right? Mm-hmm. They 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 define what's known and unknown by their status and by the fact that they're considered to be foolish, right? Yes, and that foolishness can also allow us someone to stumble upon uh and it is stumbling upon various. Well, actually, I don't know if I would say that. What I was, what I'm gonna say is, uh, the foolishness of Pilaf has allowed him to expand because in the, he didn't know Goku the first time he was trying to collect the Dragon Balls. This time he's prepared for him, so that foolishness has allowed him to encounter this chaos, which is the Red Ribbon Army. Incorporate the new technology make better power suits than he had before, and make something more advanced than the Red Ribbon soldiers had to begin with. 
So Pilaf's actually done quite a lot. Right. Is it is it in this episode where he refers to his technology as as a uh, does he call it demonic or something like that? He basically refers to it as unholy, right? Perhaps in the I think it might be the it next might be in the next one, but but he he knows that mm -hmm. what his intellect has created is unholy, and that that is that thing. Is it the one star ball that he has again? And that's that foolish foolishness, that's right? That light bringer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that, the foolishness that in thinking that, yeah. that you are that you would do right if you were in that position. And it's actually uh well we'll get to that in the next episode. Yeah. I was gonna but say. but yeah, that's you know, that stumbling upon that in foolishness is it's like, yeah, naturally it would be something that he has because he still is that foolish that he thinks that he's competent enough to be the ruler of the world and here he is yet again holding on to that foolish idea. And but I will say there are there are pieces of evidence to indicate that he has grown in in ways, right? He actually came up in he came up with the idea of having just one ball. He didn't need to collect them all. He allowed Goku to collect the rest, right? And so he's had the spy satellite. We don't even know how long he's had the spy satellite. Yeah. But we do know that his whole plan was to just collect one so Goku couldn't collect them all, well, which is such a foolish adversarial thing, right? I'm going to have one so no one can have any. It's understanding that uh, almost only really counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, right? And he's looking at Goku and saying, as long as you don't have everything, then you have nothing. Mm-hmm. And, zero sum game. And so he's playing that zero sum game. Now I want to talk about the satellite too, because this is a further extension of what we've been talking about this entire arc, right? So we talked about Bulma's ability to map outside of herself. We talked about Red's extension of himself. We've talked about Goku learning that through his interactions with Korin. And now we see it with Pilaf in that the way that he's able to think that he understands Goku fully is the same thing. This is his arrogant and this is the way that he does it, right? We see that he has interpreted that his ability to do that is so high that it's it's extraplanetary. It's above everything. He has a satellite above everything. Well, it looks down on the world. I think that's to say that it's part of the foolishness to only see the big picture, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Pilaf does. He's like trying to see the big picture of him ruling the Earth. And it's like, well... What details are in there? And we're gonna get to, into more of that. Next yeah, he's episode. he's not one for the details because he he thinks, and that's his arrogance, right? He thinks that by knowing all of these details, well, he thinks that his that, intellect will will craft the, the his success, right? Right. He's saying he, basically he believes that his intellect is such that if he was the ruler, he would do the right thing. Exactly. Yeah. That arrogance, that foolishness in that arrogance. Yes, and we're gonna expand on that as we go. So I think we've uh, covered uh, the peel-off. One was... thing I, I want to point out about that arrogance too. So whenever he's he's talking about um, being the ruler of the world, he he leans back and he laughs, and then there's a squirrel up in the tree that's oh, eating yeah. an apple, and it drops the core, and then he eats the core and swallows it for face. Right? He doesn't want to look foolish, so he eats the core. He eats the remainder rather than anything substantive. I think that's what pull, what peel-off is, right? So he's. He's the remainder. And so well, and it is also to say that this is Mother Nature being the antithesis of what it is to Goku does not help him, but it actually Right. It it, it doesn't so Baba even hinder fed him. him meat, right? Fed him a full course meal before his challenge. And Mother Nature gave him the remainder, gave him the core of the apple, which is not gonna sustain him, and he has to swallow it down a joke, for face. Right? It's right? almost like Mother Nature making fun of Pilaf. And Pilaf, instead of understanding that instead takes it in anyway as a wasteful thing so that he can appear strong. And it's like, it's perfect for Pilaf's character that that's that they do that right at that moment, right? So I just wanted to point that out because it's, it's pretty funny. I agree. So then we get back to uh, Goku and Grandpa Gohan's fight. So back in the fight, Baba suggests that Goku give up. And Goku says that he never would. As Goku... Go Goku... Gokan, there we go. New As character. Gohan slams him into the ground, the Goku watch in horror, discussing whether they should forfeit the fight for Goku. Goku Gohan notices their concern and tells Goku that he's made a some made some wonderful friends. 
Roshi tells everyone that Goku wouldn't want them to cause him to lose the fight. Suddenly, Goku's tail is ripped off by the assault being slammed over and over. Angry with his opponent for ripping off his tail, Goku begins advancing on him menacingly with a furled brow, let's say. Just then, the masked fighter concedes after laughing. Confused, Goku says that he recognizes his smell again. Gohan tells him that he's disappointed that he's neglected to toughen up his tail, and Goku suddenly realizes who the masked fighter must be. Gohan says it's deplorable that he's just now realizing who he really is, and as Gohan removes his mask, he reveals himself, and Goku rushes him in tears. There's a lot to this part. Um, I think the first thing to really talk about is that the crew, as they're watching Goku receive this treatment, is they're, they question how fair it is that that he could die in this encounter, right? They're saying, because Roshi's revealed that this must be Grandpa Gohan, and they're saying, well, it's just not fair. He, How could he possibly treat him like this? He's going to kill him. We have to save Goku from this encounter, right? And Roshi, he, it shows a little gleam in his sunglasses, right? We see that happen sometimes. Mm, yeah. And And then he says that Goku would not be happy having lost the fight. That it would he would not be happy with them and he wouldn't be happy in general if his friends made it so that he didn't win this fight. Because Roshi remembers the stakes of this fight are not Goku's safety. The stakes of this fight are redeeming the father. The stakes of the fight are reviving Upa's father, right? And the I also want to mention they say that Gohan's dead. How could it possibly be Gohan? And Roshi doesn't know, but he says it's a battle of destiny. Yeah, he calls it a battle of destiny. And that's why they can't intervene as well, right? This... And he also says Baba would not allow them to use cheap tactics like throwing in the towel. Yeah. And that's that's how nature is, right? In nature, you don't get to throw in the towel. There's no Everything's life and yeah. death, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he's stared into the abyss now. So, uh, after... Wait, where were we? So, yeah, Roshi tells them that. And he tells them that uh, Gohan. What does he tell them about Gohan? Anything else? I don't think so. I think right after that, yeah. he rips his tail off. I think it is right after that. So right after he slams him the last time and his tail comes off, Goku uh, holds his britches as he jumps around the screaming. arena. Screaming. Screaming. Um, and then Goku's pissed off, so he, he squares up to the masked man. And the masked man concedes. Gohan concedes. Right. When he sees how angry Goku is, he's well, now that he's removed Goku's weakness by ripping his tail off, which is, we talked about the remainder, right? So with Pilaf, where nature hands him the remainder and he has to swallow it. So the tail is like a remainder in a sense for somebody, whereas it, your weakness is the thing that trails behind you and connects you to who you were. But it also is something that ties you to, um, to your core identity, right? And it can be grabbed onto and it can cripple you because that is what it, it grounds you, so to speak. And so losing that remainder, losing that is sort of like Goku losing his weakness. And and that's something that once that's gone and Goku's angry, right? This is a different kind of anger because this is Goku not just angry from an emotional sense, but but he's lost something really important to himself. Right, he's lost that grounding sense that leads him back to his grandfather. So, without knowing that this is Gohan, it's like you have severed this tie that I have to this deep ancestral wisdom I have about who I am, and I'm going to come at you with a righteous fury. And so, Gohan knows that, and he's like, "I concede." Like now that he knows how strong Goku is, and that that's the only way that he could actually hold him down, there's no point in continuing the fight, right? Absolutely. But I do want to touch on uh, a little bit of why it is removed. So like we've been saying before, too, um, when a person gazes into the abyss, the abyss can stare back at them, but if they keep gazing and they keep digging into the darkness, they'll find the solution to their suffering in the form of the ancestral spirit, Grandpa Gohan. Right. Now, what does that ancestral spirit do after that? reveals the flaws inherent in that person and the in that revealing those flaws shows 
that individual who they could be, and the answer to their suffering is not someone else, but it is who they could be. And so the the idea here is that Gohan removes his tail so that he doesn't have to worry about becoming, uh, let's say, ven- not vengeful, um, what do I want to say uh, with the transformation? So he doesn't turn into the Uzaru, let's say. To be more specific, so turning in the, the turning Which, yeah, into we the need to be more specific, yeah. Where it you embody all of the most base and, and bestial, bestial yeah. uh, aspects of humanity, right? Um, and so by Gohan removing that, it's it's putting Goku into an ego state, right? His shadow is is sort of like severed from him, right? Yes, that's a good way to say it. So since his s- shadow has been severed from him, he's not going to. Uh, let's say, kill a bunch of Red Ribbon soldiers again. Right, so what's coming after Gohan here now is it's like... Uh, I don't think Goku kills anyone after this, any any mass amounts of people. It's just individuals. Like, uh, I definitely want to talk about that because this is the purpose of doing this. Yeah, this, is, this is this moment where the tail gets ripped off is the entire reason that Goku is here because... He needs to know what to do with this moral spiritual weakness. Yeah, he needs to know to, he he needs to know also what to do with his immense power now that he's instantiated in the world. Same thing with Superman. What happens with Superman when he finds out he has powers and he's an alien, right? He goes to the Fortress of Solitude and talks to his father who guides him on the proper way to conduct oneself in that situation. Yeah, it's 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 the exact same thing, right? What do you do with the realization that you are an expression of something that is supernatural, right? Because that's and as the that's hero, what we are, right? As the hero instantiated, as someone who is wielding his agency and power such that Goku has, he is almost a mythical being amongst everyone else. Well, that's why this is a mono myth here, mm-hmm. because that's what we are, myth, right? Yeah. Because we, we as human beings individuals, with consciousness, individuals, right. individuals with consciousness are an expression of an idea that's higher than nature, mm-hmm. right? It's an expression of something of a logic or a logos that transcends need and, and just desire. And so what Gohan does here is he defines it. He separates, this is who Goku is, right? And here's a lot of motivation for you. Here is your connection to the thing that is the foundation for you. And whenever that happens, we see that Goku is still oriented properly because something that would attack that is something that needs to be attacked with uh, prejudice, let's say. And so that's why he acts the way he does. He squares up on him, and now he's fighting for real. And that was the whole reason. I feel like this is a test um, because we're going to see as Gohan explains why he did what he did, that this is a situation where how Goku would respond to being separated from his tail is going to define who Goku is morally, right? Not not just who Goku is, but who he could be. Meaning that, meaning Gohan is basically telling him, you don't need this. Which this is a lesson that will come back. Right. Will definitely come back. And and by you don't need this, we mean you don't need to be weighed down by the ancestral baggage of your past. Not just that, but it's something that you need to integrate and strengthen, right? Well, and that's where we're going to get to, right? In order to be able to do that and to square, it has to be a a relationship that's that's been developed. Or you should say, don't let it be a weakness to you. Mm -hmm. Well, it should should be developed. And if it is developed, then it's not necessarily a weakness. If one understands the ancestral... Uh, struggle, let's say, then it is it is not necessarily one. But Goku is kind of ignorant of it, and that I mean, he's ignorant of the fact that he killed Gohan to begin with. Exactly. So that whole idea is like, let me remove the idea that you might even find that out as well. Let me remove the idea of uh, the realization that you're the monster, that the monster lives within you. Yeah. Right. Right. And so that's kind of the take. That's what the ancestral spirit can do. For an individual. That's what the father can do. He can uh, postpone and eliminate those struggles if they're, let's say, confronted too early. And I mean, Goku obviously has 
not been able to square away the shadow and his waking consciousness as we've seen with the Uzaru form in Pilaf's castle. It's to- it's not even Goku. It's it's a different identity altogether, right? right. We're not going to see that be articulated out in a more sophisticated way until Z, right? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a while, right? So, but we're having it established here as a foundation it's for this, that. And that's why this is so so big of a big of a moment. Yeah, this uh, is a in, hu- this is like the story. top 5 episodes of Dragon Ball, I think, just because of how foundational this is for the core themes and ideas behind the whole series. Right. Yeah, I I I agree strongly. Yeah. So, uh Goku after he gets mad at him and after Gohan concedes, uh he removes his mask and Goku rushes him and he cries for the first time. A couple of things about that. So whenever he concedes, Goku says he recognizes his smell again, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to like derail specifically what we're talking about, but another reference I'd like to make is I just finished the series Demon Slayer. So a lot of people who are fans of anime will know that the protagonist of Demon Slayer has this extremely powerful sense of smell, and he can essentially smell truth almost. And that smell, that idea of smell, as, a, as differentiated from sight, is actually really interesting um, whenever it comes to a more archetypal expression. I was listening to Alan Watts talk about, you know, different revelations made by um, Zen monks. And he said that one Zen monk had spent a lot of time at a monastery and somebody asked him, well, what did you learn in all your time? And he said, the eyes are horizontal, but the nose is perpendicular. And that was it. That was the only explanation. I didn't know what that meant for a while. I feel like I have a better grasp on that when you think about the idea that the nose, let's, let's talk about fruit, right? So our idea. Not to derail the cut. Go well, ahead. our idea of, yeah, yeah. of sight and our, our ability to see colors or true colors, you could call it, come from that idea of, of self-preservation to see if a fruit is ripe or if it's bad. But our sense of smell can it's, tell us sooner. It's also older. Yeah, the sense right. of smell is the oldest sense we have. I'm That's sure. how we differentiate good and bad, right? Mm-hmm. You can differentiate if something is good for you or bad for you through your sense of smell yeah, before like your sense of sight can tell eggs, you. Eggs, for example, yeah. And so we talk about the cross, right? You've got the horizontal and the and the and the vertical, right? So the nose. There's this spiritual idea with your sense of, and that's with breathing techniques as well. You breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, right? And that's again, the nose is vertical upward, and the mouth yeah. is horizontal. And so the the in through the nose is it's the spiritual thing where you take in spiritually all that can be good and you differentiate all that can be good and then you release everything that's bad. And it, and there's this interesting thing about that where he when he concedes and stops being adversarial to him, he smells that he's good. He senses right because this is before we have key sensing in the in the series, but he senses that he's good before he can see that he's good. Right, and that's what the mask is doing—is it's tricking him, it's tricking his sight. But Goku can still sense that he's good. The uh, the your nose can't be so easily tricked. Exactly, Mm -hmm. but archetypally, also your nose is the primordial sense of good and bad, right? Mm -hmm. And so, then Goku rushes him Mm -hmm. in tears. This is the first time we see Goku cry, and his eyes are watering. Right. Was the first? I mean, there now his sight tears catches up to his nose, right? Well, yeah, his sight catches up to his nose and is occluded by water. Let's say, and and the the gang mentioned that uh, he's just a kid still, like, and this is this is to say that uh, Goku has the the road traveled by someone who's lost their father figure is a tragic one. Goku's story in the beginning, ultimately, and how Grandpa Gohan died was a tragedy. The context of of Goku's position in this world is very similar to Superman, right? Where you have you don't have an earthly parent, you know, and this is this is typical of the hero myth, right? But here, he he's the reason. It's even better. So I want to tie it in real quick because there's that idea 
I mean, you can die, tie it into like Harry Potter, for instance, where it's necessary for Harry not to have his earthly parents and for them to have been gone before his memories are intact or before his identity is intact because there is a conceptualization of um of the proper masculine and feminine that are tra um what would you call like transcendent of of the earthly or the physical or the yeah i was gonna say uh orphans are children of the earth right or children of of the of mankind itself rather than a person right yeah it's more instantiated that i mean that's why batman is right yeah frodo baggins Hmm. Who's Frodo's dad? Robert Bur <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. But for real. See, that's why I love Bobby. Yeah, Bobby B. Um, true hero of the story. True hero. <laughs> true hero. 100%. So anyways, right. Uh, the the uh, heavenly parents and the earthly parents, though. Uh, that, is an, uh, that is an expansion, right? Because here in, in Superman, right, we have the earthly parents, the Kents, and you have uh, Superman's Kryptonian parents, right? Here you also have Bardock and Jean. I don't know how you say her name, but his mom, and then you uh, also have Grandpa Gohan, which is like his earthly parental, right? I would like to point out, too, as an aside, that that is how something like Harry Potter is differentiated from Superman, right? Where the earthly parents for Superman are a moral guide, the earthly parents for Harry are like the opposite, how not to be. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And there's an inversion with many, many things in Harry Potter that way. Well, even still, I mean, um, Harry's... Actually, never, I don't know enough about it. I'm not going to say. We'll talk about it someday because I think there's fun things to point out about how, um, how J.K. Rowling almost intentionally subverts the myth for her own ends at times. Oh, interesting. Okay. But so yeah, anyways, that's that inversion, right? right? Where it's like the earthly parents should serve as a guide as to the proper place for the earthly uh, expression of the masculine and feminine. And somehow there's the opposite of that in, in the, like the Harry story, right? But Goku doesn't have that at all. He has no connection to an earthly parent. And so there's a reconciliation here where he finally gets to, on screen at least, interact with an earthly parent. Well, we and we through we, this the needs to happen guys. and we're going to talk about that in just a second. I think yeah. we, we're ready uh to move on other than saying I do also want to mention it's the first time Goku cries and I want to talk a little bit about crying and what it what mm -hmm. it is, right? So crying is a when you lose control of your physiological response, right? And so uh an emotional It's the response. opposite of laughter, right? Yeah. But it's also losing control. Like laughter, you're. I mean, you can try and hold in a laugh, but we'll see if you can. Right? Exactly. It's a. It's a loss of control. It's the body takes over, right? Yes. And so, Goku actually is very much in command of his emotions throughout all we've seen, and this this display is almost um one of the excusable times for the masculine to be able to drop that veil. Let's say and not be in control of his emotions because this is, like I said... The eternal father. The eternal father, and he is showing his vulnerability to him um, because that's what... I know, that's what the ancestral spirit does is expose those vulnerabilities. And so Goku just gushes out here once he figures out who it is. And then it's Bulma to say that it's okay. And right? Yeah, and it is Bulma to say it's okay because normally, what is it, when a man cries, a, a woman doesn't like that. That actually has a lot of science and data behind it. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, it depends on the context, but there's only very, very few occasions in which a masculine person is. Uh, They're permitted. Yeah, and this is. I would say this is one of them, definitely. Right. It. It's interesting because Bulma comes through and says, "Well, actually, or no, it's actually Yamcha." I think Yamcha acknowledges it as well, and he says, well, after all, Goku's still a kid. Um, and so there's, and that's part of Gohan recognizing how good Goku's friends are and that they can recognize the good in Goku so that Goku can cry in front of them and they can recognize it as proper or being put in the proper service, right? Let's say not a moral or character flaw. Right. Yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, move on. Oh, wait, did I? Oh, no, I'm not even going to try that right now. 
So. Um, one thing I, I do want to point out about that too is what what Gohan says to Goku is he says he warned him about that many of a time many a time about how he needed to toughen up his tail. Yes. And that Goku hadn't done the work to toughen up his tail, right? And and that idea that I don't think he could. No, I don't think he has the context to do it un until kind of now. Now he went the opposite direction, yeah. right? He went to the logos. He went upward. He went and interacted with Corin, but he didn't. He had not contended with that deeper, darker nature in human nature until he got here with Baba, who is the the point by which you have to like cross, and right? The, yeah, it's the threshold of the underworld, right? Exactly, and so it's it's kind of funny because it's not a test that Goku could have passed, I don't think, for for Gohan. So he comes down here, and it's Gohan well, isn't saying isn't that like, always though what it is? Is I mean. That it's kind of indicative and almost um, quintessential for the fatherly and judgmental paternal spirit to never be satisfied because you're not all you could be ever. Right. You have not integrated all of potentiality, which is in chaos. Right. Yes. And so, like we, like I mentioned earlier, the answer to the problems at hand are who a person could be, based on where they come from. Yeah, based on where they are right now. And so Grandpa Gohan does exactly that. And so Gohan apologizes to Goku for removing his tail, saying that he wanted to admonish him for neglecting his weakness. I think that's where we're at. Yeah. And he asks Goku if it was Roshi who taught him to be this strong. Gohan then explains that he didn't want to reveal his identity since Goku would naturally hold back against him if he knew that it was him he was fighting. Bulma asks Gohan if he's able to stay here. And Baba explains that she uses a large, uh, uses large sums of money that people pay her for a service to hire dead fighters to fight for her. She says that Gohan asked her to tell him if a boy with a tail ever showed up. He knew. He knew. Well, that's be, and I think he knew because Gohan set him on the path, right? And you can even see. There's kind of that that path that Goku's already on that the divine path that he begins with in episode one, right? So he's already set him on the path to, to towards that logos, towards the, the uh, heroic even. And especially with uh, his moral teachings, his manners and things like that, right? If I, it, my grandpa told me if I ever meet a girl, I'm supposed to be extra nice to her, right? Right, and we saw, I can't believe you're not bowing to me in this fight. Mm -hmm. Where are your manners? Well, it is really like a father at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Gohan then thanks Roshi for all that he's done to strengthen Goku. But Roshi says that even he couldn't have foreseen this potential, as he only taught him the basics. Gohan asks Roshi on, at, on the side if Goku has ever turned into a great ape. And Roshi says that it hasn't been a problem since he destroyed the moon. Goku interrupts them by telling Gohan that he has something to show him and runs to fetch the four-star ball. When Gohan is surprised that there are more balls, Bulma tells him that it was thanks to the Dragon Ball that Goku's life changed, specifically by meeting her. Oh, man. There's so oh, much to say about I know. this part. We're, we're here again. We're back in episode one. It's all coming full circle now, and that that's why the next section is a montage to talk about all of that. And I mean, this is, I would say that this is kind of like the first real close to the the well th these series of episodes is the first close to the real first arc of dragon ball like the real first journey for goku mm -hmm. i would agree it it's it ties up because up to the first interaction with the eternal dragon is like a preface right it's, it's almost like out genesis, genesis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. laying out the context of everything we have the introduction of the idea of the eternal dragon then we have the hero's journey to integrate the, the knowledge of the eternal of that, dragon. Yeah. And now we're finally arriving there, right? Because the first time that the balls were gathered was not by Goku, right? Right, exactly. And so um, this is the first time the hero has has undergone that process. Yes, undergone the, the truth-seeking process, the uh, light-seeking process even. Yeah. Uh, and in the process has established his aim as the re redemption of the... Uh, paternal spirit mm -hmm. 
And so uh, I do want to mention a couple things. So Baba using her money to hire dead fighters to fight for her is pretty hilarious because what do dead people need money for? It's pretty funny that uh, it, the way they show it is is like Gohan chimes in. He's like, for a lot of money, too. Yes. And that's the weakness in the father. Yeah, and it we see shows that, that. Yeah, We see that even more in the next section um, because... He says there's plenty of peachy, peachy yeah. gals in the afterlife. So well, we see that Gohan wants money, right? Now, Roshi doesn't want money. Roshi, I mean... He wanted he, he that diamond. He wants it, right? Yeah, he, but at just the end like of the he day, wants launch. Yeah, at the, but at the end of the day, right, he lives as a hermit. He lives by minimal means. But the thing is that what, what happens whenever he wins the Tenkaichi Budokai? He spends all the money nourishing Goku, right? He doesn't keep that for himself. And so it's even almost, though he's, he yeah. knows he has a want for it, you know what I mean? It's, it's almost like someone that plays cards with their friends and is better than everyone but lets them win their money back or he takes their money and spends it on them by, by taking them all out for drinks or something right that would be even better yeah that's yeah even better yeah so it's one of those things where and that was what i was saying i think in the last episode of the episode before with the kitsune where there's a trickster aspect of this ancestral spirit where it does bad quote unquote in the service of good well just like uh dads can play pranks let's say sure that are good spirited yeah and he is good spirited in that sense. Definitely, definitely. And so, uh, the other thing, Goku turning into the Uzaru. So it's mentioned here in reference that it was, it was Goku that killed him. He's like, "Hey, look out for this!" Right? Right. He's like, "Hey, did you guys run into this aspect of the potential within Goku?" Yes. And Roshi says, "I dealt with it by destroying the moon," mm-hmm. which is. Let's say, let's re uh, refer back to what we were saying in the Budokai. Um, destroying the moon is that removal of the potential for Goku to be possessed by the ancestral shadow. Right, it's severing his connection to it, right? Which is, I think we talked at that time about how it kind of ties into Sun Wukong and his fall from the cosmic strength that he has whenever he doesn't respect the Buddha, right? Mm-hmm. And so... Roshi kind of points out to Gohan here that he said, well, he had that propensity for monstrousness and I shut it down by severing his connection to the cosmic. You know? Yes. And the connection to the cosmic will be back. Oh, it's not done. <laughs> so, not by a long shot. So despite Roshi's best efforts. So, uh, and the last thing that I want to mention here is... Actually, two things. Well, well, Goku doesn't. So Goku interrupts, but then they like they they don't want Goku to hear, and Goku doesn't find out, right? So this is sort of like they know it would be would be bad right now for Goku oh, to know. T- it would be horrible that he fundamentally contains that monster. Well, what is nature. that? What is, what would that breed? Well, we'll talk about it in Z. We will. So, the uh, last thing I want to mention here is the Dragon Balls. So Gohan really didn't understand. The Dragon Balls, like no one, I mean, even Roshi had one. He didn't understand it either, right? Um, And so he's surprised that there are more to begin with. And then he is approached by Bulma to say how the balls have changed Goku's life since he's, since Gohan's been dead. And it's pretty much getting ready to tell Goku's full story. So like Bulma steps up as this heroic feminine sort of archetype and says, Guess what you did? Yeah. You instilled within Goku such a powerful potential that I sought him out, right? That he was there when I came to find this aspect of reality, this aspect of potential. And she's, it, it's basically, it's so funny because it's like she knows. Well, it it's not an egotistical type up, of knowing, yeah. but, but it's, she's, she fulfills her role. She steps up and she says that Goku's life changed this way. Right. And it was because of what you left to him that when I went out, I, as the her- as the heroic feminine, or you-, you could say the archetypal feminine hero story, as I went out to do what I'm supposed to do, that he was there. And so it's there's a reverence that Bulma has towards Gohan as well. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Definitely. And I think uh, they all kind of do because they all love Goku, right? And mm-hmm. it's, it's a result of, of Gohan's teaching. And so now Go- Gohan needs to see the fruits of his labor. So we have this other, this next montage uh, showing all the major events in the story leading up to this moment as Gohan is caught up on what has happened following Bulma finding Goku in the wilderness. Gohan says that he had no idea the ball was so important. And when Krillin tells Upa that he will definitely have his father revived, Upa despairs that Goku won't be able to get his own grandfather back. Another thing that reminds me of, or let's say, Makes me think of Upa as a potential Goku, let's yeah. say. And so he despairs that he won't be able to get his own grandfather back. But Gohan says that he actually enjoys the afterlife, especially since there are plenty of peachy, peachy gals. Yamcha says it's only natural for Roshi's best student to also love girls. And I like this this montage here. It's uh, We rewatched this after we created our sort of uh, channel trailer slash intro. And it's like it covers almost everything that we gathered manually to try to show uh, the core aspects of the story. Now, it doesn't include some of the things that I think need to be there. There's no mention of Corrin here. I think Corrin is like fundamental to the or story. Or Bora. Yeah. Who's also There's fundamental. There's no Bora here. Uh, we see one shot of Tau, I think. Um, we don't really see the tower. We don't see. There's a lot of stuff that I wish they would have shown, but for how quick this goes, this is a really good little montage. Yes. Yeah. I agree. And they have some new supplemental art, right? Where they show the, the villains tower superimposed over there. Superimposed in uh, front of sort of a nice landscape. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um I, I like it a lot. And there's a really cool shot here. We're seeing it right now where Bulma and Yamcha first uh recognize each other, right? Where they're their eyes are sort of open and they see each other for who they really are for the first time. And they sort of understand the nature of the quest that they both have been on this whole time. Um, that sets up sort of the balancing of the feminine and the masculine and the genesis of the story. Right. But it's a, it's, it's a really good sequence that kind of, I don't remember what it says in the English. It's probably just, they play it like a recap. I don't like that. I really like the the musical segments here where it it's like, just take a second, look at these lyrics. The lyrics are referring to specifically what's happening in the story and what has happened. It's like, come out, dragon, just for me. It's talking about these themes we're talking about, right? It's referring to what the story is actually getting at. But whenever we see it in English, it's like, Goku went back and he did all of these things. And Gohan was really impressed by him. It's like, doesn't contribute anything. I actually really like the music video we get instead, similar to the Red Ribbon one. Definitely. The Red Ribbon one, uh, I think, as well. Uh, I need to change the dimensions on this. Yeah, they say it can fulfill any dream, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I just want to mention the recap kind of leads us into Gohan's recognition of the journey that Goku's been on. And how not only is he strong, um, but he has and he has good friends, but he's on the this noble path, right? He didn't know before this what Goku was gonna use the Dragon Balls for. Right. Right. And so now he learns that that is settled too. And as that is all settled, the ancestral spirit kind of recognizes that. It's it's okay. He he doesn't have to worry about Goku. Yeah, he and that's part of the recognition that he found whenever he was beating him down by his tail. He saw that his friends were all very concerned about him. And he told him during the fight, Oh, you've made all these good friends, and Goku didn't know what that meant. And he said, Your friends don't matter in this fight though. And so after the fight they do matter though. In the context of the worldly, right, in society instead of just nature, it really does matter. And that's what actually is able to give Gohan that that peace of mind. Well, let's say the propagation of the archetypal hero and the, let's say, the, the flourishing of the archetypal hero actually nourishes the idea of the spiritual father. 
And so now he's able to rest in peace, let's say. Yeah, he's, re- he's able to rest easy that his protege is putting his influence into the world. Well, that I would say that's for any parent, right? Any parent would want to see their children be a good person. And that's what he realizes here, right? That Goku's a good person. What? What's up? I think we're on the wrong one. Are we? Just because I saw Baba talking about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Oh, I thought we were. I thought we had naturally transitioned to that. Okay, because we're talking about that right there. Look at the first. I just haven't said it yet. Gotcha. So I will go ahead and say what's going on in these sets. Uh, Gohan says that now he's seen how strong Goku is and how great his friends are. He can return to the afterlife without worrying. Right. That's what right. I was talking about. That's why I switched him. He then thanks Baba and tells Goku he looks forward to seeing him again someday in the afterlife. Goku tells him after he disappears that the next time his tail grows back. He'll toughen it up and become even stronger. Baba si- then sings. Is this, this is in Japanese and in? I don't think it's in Japanese. So there's three stages, right? We have the original, which n- neither of us speak the language. So we can't say for sure what's really being said in the series. We have the sub, which is a translation, but sort of like Americanized for us. Then we have the dub, which is a further translation from that. And so the midpoint, we really try to go off of that sub because it's closer to the spirit of what's said. So I don't know what she sings in the original, but, but I twinkle, do like, twinkle, little star is great for it's her, beautiful. Right? Yeah, it's perfect. It is uh, that opening up of oneself to the divine chaos that can arise, right? And so Bob is a master of that, being the chaotic spirit, right? Um, the chaotic feminine spirit, who is that white dot in the black paisley. And she sits on it, and she looks into it, right? And that's how she's able to find it. It's looking at that star in the night. It's almost exactly the same thing. And so right. being open to that, uh, while while um, being open to that, while in the mire of the underworld, or the, uh, let's say the back black paisley, um, uh, is almost divine. And so she can find things that others cannot by that openness. And so. And it also is is apparent that she's open uh, in in other ways as well. She is stingy, but she gives Goku food. Her fighters come from all over, right? She is open to um, experiences, I guess. Okay, got it. Uh, so I was pulling up the lyrics to "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." How I wonder what you are up above up the above the world, the world so high, high, like a diamond in the sky, right? And then it says, "When the blazing sun is gone, when the nothing shines upon." Then you show your little light, twinkle, twinkle, all the night, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And it goes on from there. It's kind of repetitive after that. But I do really like that idea that's like, then it says like, uh, in the dark blue sky you keep and through the curtains peep, you never shut your eye till the sun is in the sky. And so, yeah, it's like, we kind of take for granted all of these little nursery rhymes and jingles and stories and, and uh, like, uh, Christmas songs are a really good example of this because they really keep that spirit whenever they talk about like the Christmas star. Like, why do we put a star on top of the Christmas tree, right? Right. And of course, of all the songs that uh that Baba would sing, this is not a really complicated one, but it's but that it reverence is... towards the elevation and the light that comes from above, even in the night sky, right? Well, especially in the night sky. Specifically. Right? Because that's where that, that's where, and this is part of the, the Christ story and why we celebrate Christmas is because the time mm-hmm. when the greatest light can arise is in the darkest time. And it's that's the solstice, right? Yeah. And so Baba sings that to find the last dragon ball. And when Goku asks where it is, Go, uh, Baba says it's approximately 200 kilometers away and heading toward them. Goku tells Upa that he's going to finally bring his father back to life. And that's where we end the episode. Right. She shows a, it, it's in a pink car driving yes. down the road. We don't know who it is yet. I mean, we can assume. We know who it is. Yeah. And so they don't know who it is, though. And they won't. It's funny that it's in that pink car. And we're talking about that twinkle, twinkle. And it's like, we're going to find the last star in the darkest part of the night before the dawn, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it is, is it in the darkest car. place? Well, it's in a pink car. What does that mean? We'll, yeah. we'll talk about it in the next episode. We will. We'll, we'll get into it. Anything else we want to wrap up here? Um, I like the the interactions at the end of the episode between um Gohan and Roshi, right? Where 
Gohan is very thankful to Roshi for what he's done, and he he credits Roshi for the strength that Goku has shown, but then Roshi tells him, well, I only showed, showed him the basics. But then also we know that Roshi told Goku, I can't teach you anything more than this. So there's this kind of, it sounds like a bit of a dichotomy, but it's like Roshi's spirit is such that the most that he can teach him are the most important things, which are the foundations or the basics of what he's going to become. And so... Which is not how to become a better person or become a more heroic figure. It's not necessarily that. It's how to orient oneself in the world and how to act in a way which produces moral results. Yeah, he teaches him ethic, right? Yeah. He teaches him a work ethic. He teaches him honesty. Like a and lot that's of where it has things. to start. That's where it has to start. And that's why it's foundational, right? And so, and Gohan thanking him profusely shows that reverence that Goku once had, right? Back when he was just starting out and he was very polite to people. Right. This, these are the circumstances that create the archetypal hero, right? Which is that, um, that Goku ultimately could not have. my tail grows back i'm going to strengthen it and become even stronger and so oh shit so he he's basically telling he's telling gohan there that he has learned his lesson right he's learned what gohan needs to teach him which is that he needs to strengthen his weakness and actually become stronger and transcend the strength that he's already found that is that has made him the strongest person in his own little uh cosmic space right Mm -hmm. for now for now for now so i think that's a good place to leave off i really hope that audio is not all messed up i looked uh, i think it was just at the end because you got some static electricity yeah i definitely did i kept checking after i got up to make sure because i was very reckless but uh let's go ahead and wrap this up then i also want to say though real quick before we end about um the this this final little moment that we see and this is the final canon moment we see of grandpa gohan in the entire manga series right we will see him again in the anime but as far as the manga goes the last time we see him and i want to say that that's because this earthly spirit a uh, earthly parental spirit for Goku is now satisfied in the way that Goku has has matured beyond its needs. And all all people do that eventually. I mean, when when people's parents die, they have to re, yet they have to assume that that um, responsibility and grow beyond that, right? And so that's what we see is expected of Goku here. And uh, I think a lot of what Goku does from here on out is guided by this. And we'll talk about that more as we get into the events later in Dragon Ball. Yes. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. If you like what you heard, please give us a like, a subscribe. We upload on Mondays and Thursdays on YouTube, Rumble Tuesdays and Fridays. Give us a subscribe. Leave a comment if you liked it, if you disagreed, whatever. We'd love to hear what you had to say. I'm your host on the left, Owl. I'm your host on the right, Brock. And we hope you guys have a good night.